Hunt Showdown is the best shooter I've ever played. Nothing comes close. To give you a basic understanding of the game concept, it's an extraction shooter where 12 players load into a map and collect clues to narrow down the possible area of a boss, which is the main objective of a match. The boss has to be killed, banished, which has a timer of 200 seconds, and then the resulting bounty token has to be taken to an extraction point. This gives you money and XP to upgrade your hunters for future matches. The other teams have that same goal, so you'll get into gunfights with each other. It's a good concept, and I'll discuss the gameplay around it, as well as some of the shortcomings of Hunt. But what I really want to focus on first are the gunfights, because they are so ridiculously fun in this game. Let's just get right into it. Why is the gameplay so good? I'd condense it down to three things. Gunplay, sound design and tactical elements. Hunt has a very unique approach to its guns because of the game's time period. It is 1895, so we have revolvers, lever action and bolt action rifles, brake and pump action shotguns. Now first off, there is the cool factor. I think these animations are fantastic. The way you feed these guns the next round through their mechanisms in a very hands-on kind of way is a lot more satisfying than most guns with detachable magazines. The guns in Hunt require a lot more manual work to operate which keeps the reload speeds and fire rates low. But Hunt also has an extremely low time to kill. Shotguns one tap if you use them at an appropriate range for that particular gun. Headshots from rifles and pistols always kill within the effective range. This combination of old guns and low time to kill puts more importance on each individual shot. The gameplay is about taking a shot and then getting into cover. You only want to expose yourself when you're in a position to fire back so you have to wait for the action of your gun to finish. In game we call this that cycle time and it allows Hunt to have guns that feel very different. In most shooters I don't really care if my assault rifle shoots 600 rounds per minute or 700. But comparing the weighty bolt action of a Mosin to the fast lever action of a Winfield completely changes the way you play with these guns. With the Mosin you want to get into cover right after firing your shot. With the Winfield you can continue firing to confirm a kill. Cycle time also gives the game a very unique style, with players firing a shot and immediately running deeper into the building. I think hunt gameplay always looks very nice. The cycling of your gun is something you always have to be conscious about during gameplay, because the cycle animation isn't just flavor, the guns remember the state they were in. If you fire a shot and immediately swap to something else in your equipment, then the gun is not ready to fire. There is no round in the chamber. You don't want to peek at an enemy and then just cycle your gun in their face. Revolvers are the only type of weapon without this mechanic, because the hammer is cocked back as you put them into your holster. The cycle mechanic is the good kind of realism in video games that still improves gameplay. There's a higher skill component to operating guns in Hunt. Thankfully, learning the cycle times for the different guns is made easier, because the UI is very clear about the state of your gun. The leftmost round on the ammo display is the shot inside the chamber. The point where it starts changing from empty to full is when you can swap away from the gun. Same thing with reloads. You could cancel the reload preemptively and have no shots in the gun. The UI tells you when the gun is reloaded. The way your gun is reloaded also drastically changes the gameplay. Hunt's reload system is very intricate. For example, the revolvers. Two of them have cylinders that become fully exposed upon reloading. For the new army it swings out to the side and the Scottfield you break open from the top. From here the reload animation has two steps, taking out the empty cartridge and inserting a new one. But this only happens on partial reloads. If your gun is completely empty then there is no reason to keep any of the rounds. All of them are ejected and your reload is twice as fast, since you now only have the animation of inserting rounds. This can make it worthwhile to just empty your gun if you're down to your last one or two shots. The other revolvers have fixed cylinders, so you always have to eject rounds, insert another and rotate to the next chamber. A cool detail on these is the way your hunter rotates the cylinder to always start reloading from the back and then rotates it to the first live round, so that you'll never have empty chambers between shots. And then there are also guns which lose a round when you open up their action for a partial reload. Ammo is a precious resource in Hunt, so the bad ammo economy of these guns might be a reason to consider other ones. But there are mechanics to work around it. 
First, there is the perk Bullet Grubber, which leads to some of the best animations in the game. The second workaround is to hold down the fire button after a shot. The cycle animation of guns happens on the release of the fire button. So if you don't release it, then you're not feeding the gun the next round. From here, you can reload with zero ammo lost. Empty cartridge goes out, new one goes in. That's very cool. And the last thing I want to highlight is the way weapons can be topped off with an extra shot if they have an internal magazine. Some guns have their ammo count displayed with a plus one for the round that can already be inside the barrel. So Crown and King for example. Magazine holds four shells. You cycle to bring one shell into the barrel and then you can add one more into the magazine. I love the attention to detail in Hunt. Guns have mechanics you can play around with. The devs looked at this time period and considered all the drawbacks guns of this time would have. But all this realism isn't just cool, it is also gameplay. The main reason why the guns have these mechanics is to make them distinct from each other and to allow for different playstyles. Let's look at shotguns. The guns always one up each other as they become more expensive. The first shotgun only has a single shot, then there's a double barrel, two different pump actions and then a semi-automatic shotgun. On paper, this sounds like a pretty basic progression system. But Hunt has great balancing and each one of these options has their pros and cons. I myself am a huge fan of that very first one, the Romero. It's the most basic gun you could imagine. It's just a pipe with a trigger on it, but it's an absolute beast. The Romero has the highest damage, the highest one shot range and the tightest spread. These stats set it apart from the other shotguns. There are some situations where you just need a Romero. One shots over nasty ranges and the tight spread allows you to get kills through some tiny cracks. A shotgun with more spread would have many pellets hit the wall. But with the Romero, you just send your cluster of angry pellets towards them and it will absolutely rip. I love this thing and I also love the playstyle it brings. The other shotguns are played closer to rifles in terms of re-peaking and waiting for the action to finish. You have that fire rate advantage. So you quickly peek for your shot and then stay inside cover to ready the next. With the Romero, it's more about ducking and weaving and using the structures you are fighting around. Only having that one single shot leaves you very vulnerable during the reload. So you should immediately put distance between you and the enemy. Run deeper into the building or dance around the structure while listening for their steps to keep the maximum distance until your shot is ready and you blast them again. All shotguns have their own reasons for why you would pick them. And even though I was just gushing over the Romero for the last minute, I actually like every single shotgun in this game. The rival has the fastest follow-up shot of all the shotguns, because you can fire both barrels with almost no delay between. The Spectre is probably the most solid shotgun. It has a one-shot range that isn't too far behind the Romero, while still having the advantage of an internal magazine. It does lose ammo on partial reloads, however. The Slate is similar to the Spectre. It has less damage and range, but more fire rate and can be reloaded without losing shots. Which makes it really fun to play by always topping off your magazine in small openings during a fight. Versus the Spectre where you'd most likely wait for a moment to fully reload. And the Crown and King is just an absolute beast because of its fire rate. I hope this small talk about shotguns helped to showcase why the different guns in Hunt are so fun. Some differences in stats could lead to very different playstyles. And this trend continues for the other weapons besides shotguns. The next important gunplay mechanic is muzzle velocity. The bullets you fire are actual objects in the world and they have travel time to reach their target. The only weapons with bullet drop are crossbows, bows and the bomb lance. For anything else, you don't need to aim above the target, you only need to lead your shot. Guns having different muzzle velocities is another way in which they can feel very distinct. Most likely, you'll find some guns where you just can't hit anything. But with others, you're landing hits non-stop. You're either leading too much or too little. I find that over time I was able to group guns into similar velocities, so that I'll have a better idea of leading with them. What's the muzzle velocity of a drilling with dum dum ammo again? 371 meters per second. Ah, so I'll shoot it kinda like a Winnie. Hunt Showdown also has an aim punch mechanic, which is essential to make the gunfights work. It gives a high incentive to have a fast reaction time. The slower player will get knocked off target. If there was no aim punch, then most ranged engagements would just be about trading damage, since you could continue aiming after receiving the hit. 
Aim punching also evens the playing field a bit in close combat. Shotguns kill with one well placed shot. That fact still makes them the most dominant weapon class in close combat. But aim punching allows counterplay for the other weapons, especially those with a fast fire rate. If you're the faster draw, then they can whiff their shot. And most weapons will kill with a second follow up hit. Aim punching with buckshot shotguns can also bring huge benefits. What's interesting is that the damage you receive doesn't change the severity of the aim punch. You could be tagged for 10 damage and still get knocked around. Because of this, I'm often shooting a shotgun way outside of its effective range, where it has no chance of landing a kill. Usually when I happen to encounter an enemy further away than I expected, I will still take the shot. The shot is more of a defensive action in this case. I want to protect myself from the enemy's aim, to get into a better position. And the last gunplay mechanic I want to talk about is wall banks. Objects in the environment can be penetrated by bullets and pellets. And they will actually deal full damage, so long as only one object was penetrated. Bullet penetration is probably the most in-depth mechanic in Hunt. The type of bullet you are shooting affects the types of objects you can penetrate. There are differences between wood, sheet metal, stone, trees and players. The different ammo types can penetrate different combinations of these materials. Special ammo can improve or completely remove the ability to penetrate. The range at which the object was hit, and in some cases even the thickness of the object can change whether the bullet makes it through. However, for 90% of fights you only need to know the answer to two questions. Can I penetrate one wooden object? And can I penetrate one sheet metal object? Hitting someone behind two pieces of cover is unlikely, if you think about the way most players peek. You mostly do it from a window or doorway. Someone could be further into the room and have some additional cover with something like a wooden beam. But that also limits the visible area for the indoors player. It's less likely for both players to line up and see each other. Wall banging through multiple objects most often happens when you start shredding through a building. In this case you probably planned for it in your loadout and brought full metal jacket ammo. Keeping in mind whether your bullet can penetrate full brick walls is simple. Because the answer is no. Only one weapon can. The Nitro Express Rifle. Hitting through multiple players is only possible with Nitro and Spitzer ammo. And also extremely rare. Thin trees can be penetrated with long ammo, Spitzer, FMJ and a Nitro. The tree trunk can only be penetrated with Nitro. But most fights happen inside or around buildings. Because the objective of the game drives players into compounds. And those compounds are primarily made of wooden walls and sometimes sheet metal. I think wall banks are amazing for the gameplay. It gives you another way to outplay your opponent by predicting their movement and positioning. You can continue tracing the enemy with your aim even if an object came between you two. And you have to be conscious about the amount of information you are giving the enemy. For example, a common mistake is to have the barrel of your gun poke out of a building or straight through a wall if you're very close and trying to see through cracks. In this case, the barrel might as well be an arrow pointing towards your head. You should be peeking a bit further into the room. And if you want to crack peek, then you can holster your weapon to the side by holding down the weapon swap button. All of these gunplay mechanics lead to a really fun sandbox of weapons, which I think is best illustrated by the drilling, my beloved. This gun has two rifle barrels and one shotgun barrel that you can swap between. It's extremely versatile. You can go with FMJ ammo if you like to wallbang. You can go with Dum Dum to cause bleeding for additional pressure. Or you can keep it on standard ammo to have much better muzzle velocity. For the shotgun you can go with slugs for further one shot ranges. And removing pellet spread since you're now firing a single projectile. Or you can keep it on standard buckshot. Pellet spread has its advantages. A slug could hit an arm or miss the enemy by just a pixel. With slugs you also need to aim down sights, while a buckshot shotgun can and should be fired from the hip. The drilling being a combination of rifle and shotgun makes for some interesting secondary weapon choices. Since you basically have both ranges covered, you could bring something that's purely utility, like a hand crossbow with special bolts. You could bring a saber for better close range coverage in case your shotgun shot missed. Or you could bring a fast firing pistol for long range. I absolutely love these kinds of gameplay choices. The variety of guns Hunt offers keeps the game extremely replayable. And honestly makes it a really fun game to discuss 
either with friends or strangers online. Some people swear by certain weapons and absolutely dislike others. As you play the game, you will naturally find weapons that just work for you. And discussing the different aspects of them is pretty enjoyable in my opinion. And so this is the first reason why Hunt Showdown is my favorite shooter. Fantastic gunplay mechanics and a fun arsenal to use. And the great gunplay is only further improved by the next core aspect. The sound design. It is incredible. I honestly think there is no game that sounds as good as Hunt. In moments of low intensity, you have an excellent soundscape. Hunt doesn't just loop a specific ambient track, but instead the objects and locations of the map trigger specific ambient sounds. The high cliffs of Desal sound windy. And the swampy areas of still water sound very musty. When you're inside a building, you can hear it groan and windows squeak in the wind. Rain hitting the roof above you sounds amazing. This very realistic soundscape is then disrupted by the supernatural elements of the game. All the monsters doing their idle sounds as they roam or screaming at you when they become alerted by something. Hearing the otherworldly sounds of the boss being banished as you try to make out enemy footsteps. And Hunt manages to sound even better when the action kicks in. Dynamites being cooked and explosions going off. Bullets flying by and ripping through wood behind you. Empty shells hitting the floor. Hunters operating the action of their gun. And my god do the gunshots sound good. But just like with gun mechanics, the sound design is something that's very cool and also extremely important for the gameplay. Hunt is heavily sound based. The maps are designed with sound traps. Crows and ducks can be heard over a large distance and they fly away into the opposite direction of the sound that spooked them. Very good info to know enemy positions. Horses, chickens and dogs continuously give off loud noises once they're triggered. Best to quickly silence them. Sound traps also exist within compounds. Broken glass and garbage on the floor. Chains hanging from the ceiling are often placed in commonly used pathways and peaking positions. And the most crucial sounds come from players. Every action you could take has a sound. From obvious things like reloading, healing, reviving teammates, to more subtle actions like swapping your equipment or breathing in when you aim down sights. Everything makes a sound, even sneaking. One of the most common mistakes of newer players is to think that enemies can't hear you when you sneak. All of the sounds are also varied enough to make informed decisions. The hunter death sound is very dramatic and kinda funny, but it's absolutely necessary that the sound effect has these two distinct parts. It needs to be different from the normal damage sound. Everyone will know when and where someone died. The remaining players will base their next actions on this death. Teammates creating openings to quickly get that player back. Enemies turning up the aggression to snowball into a win, because now they have the numbers advantage. Hunt communicates a ton of things to the player through sounds. Thrown explosives change their sound based on the distance to you. The way I'd describe it is that the dynamite sounds angry when you are close. Obvious sign to get away from it. And you can easily know your distance to an explosive without having to look at it in a gunfight. Animal sound traps change their sound based on how close you are to triggering them. This knowledge allows you to move around them without having to resort to a full crouch walk. Because you get direct feedback of how triggered they are. So you can speed up and slow down your movement. I also have to talk about the specific gun sounds. Hunt is really impressive. Because they manage to make every gun sound unique. I can tell Springfield, Martini and Sparks apart. Even though they're all single shot rifles. Springfield is very high pitched. The initial pitch of the Martini explosion is much lower. And the sound of the Sparks is altogether more muffled. When you're close enough to the shot, then you can also make out the sounds of the weapon's mechanism. In the case of the Springfield, the sound of the hammer slapping down is instantly recognizable to me. A variation of a gun can also have a distinct sound, usually when the length of the barrel has changed. The Sparks pistol isn't nearly as muffled anymore. It has a higher pitch and it sounds a lot more exposed. Makes sense, since the sound of the shot leaves the gun sooner. Every gun sound has its own characteristics but they still share common features within their weapon type. Rifles, pistols and shotguns are completely distinct from each other. But we can break it down even further. Because the different ammo types also have these common features. The explosion sound of compact ammo has a much shorter duration. 
and the reverberation time of the shots is also different for the ammo types. This is the part of the sound effect where it travels over the map and bounces off everything. And the duration of it is about twice as long when comparing long ammo to compact ammo. The gun sound can be changed further if it happened inside or underground. And lastly, the distance you had to the shot takes out more and more characteristics that made the weapon sound distinct. The gameplay impact of this whole system is huge. You can listen to gunfights and know the loadouts they are playing. With every shot you fire, you're feeding the enemies information. Expect them to know your gun and your location. A compound full of shotgun players is approached differently than a compound full of rifles. Knowing gun sounds becomes the most impactful when you also have knowledge about a ton of gun stats and the general matter of hunt. For example, if you hear a single pistol shot, then you can almost guarantee that they have a shotgun or something else that's close range. Rapid pistol shots would be from fanning. So a rifle is the most likely on that player. One very important gun sound to know is the one from the sparks. That's a rifle with 149 damage into the upper torso, 1 HP from death. When you're dealing with a sparks, you cannot be caught with anything less than full health. Some small chip damage from falling could end up killing you. Knowing gun sounds is important, and therefore having a good headset is important. It can make the difference between Centennial and Krag fighting 100 meters north next to Alice Farm. And someone is shooting. I think Hunt having this high focus on sound design is amazing. There is great atmosphere and a general style of gameplay where every player is just a little on edge trying to make out important sounds is pretty cool. Just for fun, here are my top 5 sound effects in Hunt. Number 5, the label. Number 4, the Krag. 3, the Romero Alamo cycle animation. Number 2, Meathead exploding from Bombland's shot. And number 1, a wax dynamite exploding in water. Hunt feeds you a lot of information through sounds. And what you do with this information is the next core aspect. Hunt's gameplay is very tactical. There's so much game knowledge you can learn. And smart decision making is the number one thing you need to win fights. First, there is the importance of being fast. The high focus on sound design might give the impression that Hunt is a stealth game. And while it can certainly be played that way, it is still better to be loud if that puts you in a more advantageous position. In general, it is best to be the first team for everything. The first in the compound, the first to collect a clue, the first to kill the boss. And in some situations, being loud doesn't even have a big drawback. For example, sometimes sound traps can just be triggered without giving the enemy teams useful information. When I'm playing solo, my first destination is the center of the map. I'll collect clues and rush through compounds setting off everything. Why? Because everyone spawns on the edge of the map. Setting of crows is only dangerous when you're going in a direction that has a chance of enemies being there. They could know where you are coming from and then set an ambush. But they can't be in the center of the map. They might hear me and start following the sounds I'm making. But I'm not planning on staying. Tracking my position is useless to them if I continue going towards the center. Once 5 minutes have passed, I usually start respecting sound traps. That's enough time for all the teams to be spread out. So how do you efficiently go through compounds? This is the first time I'm really talking about the PvE aspect of Hunt. Not because it's bad, but it's really secondary to the PvP. It's there to slow players down so that gunfights can happen. And to force players to make sounds. The exhale of a melee attack is actually one of the loudest noises you can make. Can be heard up to 80 meters. That's usually the first thing you hear from an approaching team. The way to efficiently kill AI is pretty straightforward. They are gonna need a variation of light and heavy attacks that's different for each melee tool. Immolators need blunt damage. Any slicing, piercing or bullet damage will make them ignite. And anyone close by will lose permanent health. Dusters, knuckle knife light attacks and the buttstock of your gun work as blunt damage. Hives have a ranged attack that poisons you. Poison is not damage over time, but it does stop you from healing yourself until the poison wore off. 
Killing the hive will stop all swarms. But if you can't get to the hive fast enough, then you should melee attack the swarm. Two light attacks with the knuckle knife is the best way. Concertina armors are best handled with throwing axes. If you don't have any and no other way of silently killing them, then it's best to outmove them. If that's not an option either, or it would take too much time, then I usually just shoot them. Meatheads see through the leeches outside of their body. When one of them tries to attack you, the meathead knows your location for a few seconds. If the attack connects, you are poisoned. If you are poisoned from any source, then the meathead knows your exact position until the poison wears off. Best to ignore meatheads entirely, they are way too tanky. If they are right on a clue, then I usually just take it and gamble that I'll only be hit once. With two players, it's pretty easy to lure the meathead by triggering the leeches, so that your partner can get the clue. The tactical decision making of PvE comes with the priorities you set. Realizing AI is going to be a problem in this fight and then luring them into a spot where you can kill them without being exposed to the enemy. Hives have a pretty high priority since they have a ranged attack and stop your healing. Immolators could be shot by the enemy to create a firebomb, so those need to be taken care of too. Sometimes the correct priority is to just ignore the AI. AI that's right outside of the boss layer could function as an alert trap if you hear a trigger on a player. If you're approaching a compound and see a fence, then you don't need to kill the enemies in front. They can't crouch or vault. Attacking would make a sound and cost stamina. Stamina has to be recovered by slow walking. So any stamina saved by avoiding unnecessary AI is speed gained. Now would be a good point to talk about Hans' movement. It's pretty standard and grounded. You walk, sprint, jump, vault and crouch. But there are still techniques to learn. First thing is to bind the vault and jump buttons to two separate keys. This allows you to jump next to windows to see further outside. Otherwise it would suck you into a vault and throw you out the building. A misplay which could lose a match. The second benefit is the ability to jump over low fences and obstacles instead of doing a vault. You clear the obstacle faster this way. And the vault locks you inside its animation, which can give the opponent a quick opening to shoot at you. You still have the ability to shoot during a jump, but not a vault. Next technique is the frog jump. Water slows you down. The trick is to jump into the water and then do one additional hop as you hit the ground. You're maximizing your airtime this way and minimizing the slowdown. The reason why you only want to do two jumps instead of jumping all the way through the water is the jump lock mechanic. Crytek doesn't want hunters to be hop around during combat. So more than two jumps in a short time will give you massive slowdown. Avoid that at all cost, as you are just a sitting target if it happens. Same goes with crouch spamming. Teabagging will nail you to the ground. While on the topic of crouching, never do a crouch peek. It's one of the most crucial tactics to learn, because you're giving the enemy three distinct advantages. The crouch animation makes it so that your head is the first thing that slowly comes around the corner. It's extremely easy for other players to just press left click on that. You are making yourself a really easy target for shotguns. By crouching, you are bundling up all your hitboxes into a tight cluster. Against a weapon type that shoots pellets in a cluster. Limbs are penetrated, so all those pellets get the high damage modifiers of the upper and lower torso. If you were standing upright, then maybe enough pellets would have missed your vital hitboxes. And lastly, wall banks. Movement is just much easier to trace when it's the slow crouching type. If you're fast and erratic during a peak, then the enemy has a harder time to predict your position behind cover. Whatever advantage you may gain by being sneaky is just not worth it. You should rather be loud for that split second of a peak, even if there's only a small chance of an enemy looking your way. That's pretty much it for movement. The most amount of depth isn't found in the mechanics, but in Hunt's map design. Every compound is unique. And because of the nature of Hunt's gameplay, they are also designed in such a way that they can be approached from every direction. And buildings will have viewpoints towards the possible compound entry points. There's a ton to learn about good pathing. Which positions will have an angle on me when I go this route? Going over the metal roof here would be extremely loud. The wooden sidewalk next to it is more quiet. There's always something you can optimize in your pathing. Landing on a fence to reduce fall damage. Staying up on the roofs to avoid AI. Or using doors to slow them down long enough for you to leave. The same goes for the map design on a larger scale. Every compound has pathways to every surrounding compound. 
And there are good paths and bad paths, depending on the situation. Some will have you walk out in the open, others will have trees as sidebreakers. Some lead you into deep water, others have sunken walkways without movement penalties. Game knowledge becomes the most important during compound fights. If you know the layout of a building by heart, then you can dance around your opponents. Always flanking and appearing from different spots. You can predict enemy movement, hearing them walk through the halls and aiming at the position where they are going to end up. Or going for a revive when you know that their path to you is too long to punish it. The cracks and sneaky peeking spots of compounds give more opportunities to outplay your enemies. You could think that you're in cover, but are actually fully exposed to the enemy. I like how important knowledge is in hunt. Makes it a really fun game to get better at. When you lose a match because your aim sucked, it's an important lesson, but not really an interesting one. Just aim better. But if you die because your opponent knew something about the compound you didn't, that's kinda tasty. I'm gonna use that next time. So as your playtime increases, you'll start gathering a mental map of all nasty spots for the 48 compounds. It is satisfying. The three aspects, gunplay, sound design and tactical elements are great on their own. But the game is amazing because of the way they interact with each other. Wall banks built on sound design and map knowledge. You can make out their steps amid the chaos. And you can trace their movement through a wall if you know the path they have to take. Sound design tells you the loadouts of your opponents. The specific mechanics of the weapon they are playing can change your tactical decision making. Knowing that you are facing a Romero means you only need to bait out one shot. Differentiating gun sounds can also help you keep track of enemy team compositions. That's a duo of two Winfield gamers. Knowing the teams is crucial in big fights to make informed decisions about who to target. And which bodies still have an alive teammate that could go for a revive. Movement is influenced by sound design. You can use loud sounds as cover to let your actions slip under and all that noise. An example would be to switch between the three movement stages, crouch, walk and sprint, based on how much the boss is screaming in their ears. To me, stealth and hunt is less about being unseen, but instead about denying information in crucial moments. The gunplay mechanic of cycling your weapon also gives room for tactical decisions. If they just fired their shot, then it is often worth it to hold that angle. You have a simple reaction by just clicking on the target as they come back into view. Then there is also the counter tactic to holding angles. You should never peek the same angle twice. Positioning is key in hunt. And the tactical elements wouldn't matter as much without the low time to kill the gunplay brings. The fact that an unaware player can be downed by a single shot is the reason why positioning is so crucial. The core aspects feed into each other to create some incredibly fun sections of gameplay. Listening for the sound of a lantern, jumping into the window frame with separated keybinds and then punishing with the tight spread of a Romero. Hearing a firebomb and peeking because that can kill. Hearing someone heal during the kill and going for a wallbang. Using the sound cover of a thrown dynamite to jump out a window and reposition next to the enemy. Using dark side to see that a duo split themselves up. Pushing one of them with a wallbang kill. Cooking a dynamite by changing the throw direction at the last second based on footstep sounds. Hearing the sound of someone using necromancer and pulling out my sparks pistol cause that's why I need a weapon XP. Hunt is just nice like that. It's why I always come back to it. I can't praise Crytek enough for their gameplay design. It's truly a one of a kind game. So far I've only discussed the action packed parts of Hunt. But everyone that has played the game knows that there's also a very different side to the gameplay. Sometimes you just walk. A lot. And I think that's okay. For some people this is going to be Hunt's biggest issue. But I'm more positive on this. It's necessary for this specific gameplay. When you get into a fight with another team, then the other teams on the map will have an exact position of your gunfight because of the sound design. The other teams need to have some form of opportunity cost to third party that fight, which is the travel time it would take to get there. Hunt's gameplay works the best when the number of players participating in a fight is kept low. That's the only way the tactical side of Hunt can shine through. It can be fun to have a huge cluster fight, 
where the entire lobby meets on one compound. But then it's less about decision making and more about everyone just making their best guess. 12 players is a lot. You can't keep track of all positions if repositioning can be done relatively quietly. With a whole lobby fight, you are likely going to get shot in the back at some point. The large maps of Hunt space the fights out. If the maps were smaller, or if there was an option for high mobility, like rideable horses, then everyone would just third party each other all the time. That would make Hunt a worse game in my opinion. I might be weird for this next one, but I also think that the gameplay of walking through the map isn't that terrible. There is always something to occupy your mind. Going for efficiency while clearing the compounds. And thinking ahead about the route you'll take and movement you can apply there. You can get into the zen state of moving fast through the map. You can listen for triggered sound traps and gunshots. And from there make a mental map about likely directions teams will move. To keep the tactical side of your brain engaged. I also get my fix on game discussions with teammates when we're walking. Discussing the loadouts we bring and what we like about them. Now if walking plus PvE was all the game is, then I wouldn't even touch Hunt Showdown. At the end of the day, it's about the PvP. That's what I come back for. But I'm also not bored by the low intensity moments. I think they make the high intensity ones stand out more. And they also give Hunt a quality that makes it enjoyable over long periods of time. Weird comparison to another shooter I've enjoyed recently, Battlebit Remastered. That game is non-stop action, with near instant respawns after death, spamming the lean left and right buttons and drop shotting to make yourself harder to hit. Great game, but I find that after one hour of this gameplay, I'm kinda satisfied. Hunt I can and have played for 5-6 to six hours in some sessions. However, I do think there could be an alternative game mode for very quick action. What I'm thinking about is a dual mode. 1v1, 2v2 and 3v3. One compound, same random loadout on everyone. Three rounds, best of three wins. Bow fights where everyone misses their shots. Combat axe rushing where everyone is trying to bait out the opponent's swings. I'd love a mode like that. Could be a good way of learning new weapons too. In Bounty Hunt and Soul Survivor, you could get into a situation where you didn't really have a chance to see the strengths of your loadout. Wanted to try a new shotgun, but got spotted in an open field by a long ammo rifle. I think removing the loadout disparity in this specific game mode would make it easier to understand the weapon mechanics in isolation. And then you can apply that knowledge in the main game mode. Knowing the bullet drop of the crossbow. Learning that the combat axe has a very slow release time before the attack deals damage. It's just much easier to pick up on these things if everyone is working with the same mechanics for up to 3 rounds. Same goes for compounds. The game has 48 compounds right now and there will be another map in the future. Duking it out on a single compound for 3 rounds allows you to learn good pathing, sound traps, angles you could hold and so on. The rewards for this game mode should be lower than Soul Survivor. So I'd say half the XP from the kills straight to the bloodline and some hunt dollars. The winning team gets more. But I don't think a game mode like that is a high priority. Hunt isn't the biggest shooter out there in terms of player count. Adding another mode would split the player base. A while back we had two separate queues on weekends. Where one of them was always nighttime and always had a single boss on the map. I like that a lot. But splitting the main game mode in two led to somewhat empty lobbies at certain times of day. The player base would first need to be big enough for a dual mode. Thankfully, Hunt's player base has a steady growth. So sometime in the future I could see this as a possibility. But not right now. Hunt is an amazing game. But it can also be a very frustrating one. So let's talk about it. There are many ways Hunt can frustrate you. You might encounter enemy playstyles you really don't enjoy. You planned out your loadout and tools for a specific playstyle, but get put into a situation where you can't utilize it, or just die before you got a chance to fire your gun. And Hunt Showdown actually has a pretty large luck component to it. First the spawn locations of bosses, players and extractions. Sometimes you just spawn with the boss right in front of you, and an extraction close by. The odds of you winning that match are stacked in your favor. Or the boss could be extremely far away with no extraction close by. Most likely have to win fights against multiple teams to make it out. 
the spawn locations of clues and AI are also random. Two teams approach a compound from two different sides because of their spawn locations. And it could be that your side just happens to be absolutely stacked with mob enemies. So you might have to fight off hives, armors, immolators and the enemy team. They are in a very good position to win that fight. Hip firing is also random. It's the most notable with dual pistols. You could miss 10 shots in a row and an enemy could hit your head on the first trigger pull over 50 meters. Medkits and ammo boxes spawn in random places. The consumables you loot are random, perks can be found randomly and the locked doors of a compound are random to an extent. Now that being said, Hunt is still a very skill based game. Good players will know how to deal with a bad hand and have most likely brought tools to account for such situations. Even if you feel like the randomness screwed you over that match, there was probably something you could have done better. And focusing on that aspect makes it less frustrating in my opinion. But then there are also times when the rules of the game break apart. Hunt is not a perfect game. It has bugs and server issues. The gunfights require some split second actions. And when some weird desync issue causes you to delay a crucial revive, then it can just tilt you for the next 5 games. Rubber banding can slow down your movement. You can be disconnected from a match, which thankfully happens most often on the initial loading screen and you get the option to reconnect. Other times it happens in a fight. The servers can suddenly have high ping for everyone or just break down entirely. I guess we hit our shots. Poor guy. There's a bug where the crosshair for a specific weapon disappears. Can be okay if it's a weapon you'd aim down sights with anyways. But if you need the crosshair to aim and it's just gone, then guess I'll die. AI can also behave in some unintended ways sometimes. Meatheads hitting you through walls for example. You can see AI spawn in right in front of you, which can be really disruptive since the gameplay trains you to quickly aim for sudden movement. Buildings can also de-render on distance. Happens a lot when you have a slow hard drive, but it can always happen. Other players render at any distance. So in this case, if there actually was someone in the building, I would see them. Even the knowledge that nobody is in the building is strong and unfair. The point is that the technical side of Hunt isn't the best, but it's also not terrible. Hunt has a decent balance of bug fixes mixed in with new content updates. I hope they continue this way. Currently a whole engine upgrade is in the works for Hunt Showdown. Hopefully that helps with things like pop-in and de-rendering. Anything to improve the technical side is appreciated. Another thing that can be annoying in Hunt is you. Sometimes it's just not your day. Your aim? Terrible. Decision making? Garbage. Reaction time? Slow. Team play non-existent. On some days you can power through and turn it around. Other days really just seem cursed. I find that Hunt is the most enjoyable when you have a variety of other games to play for those special days. Something light. I also think that Hunt's other game mode Soul Survivor is great for a bad day. It's free and it's goofy, exactly what you need. 12 solos load into a map. Find random guns, collect 4 clues to start a timer and then defend themselves against the other players. The winner gets to keep the hunter with all the equipment for the main mode. It's king of the hill with some battle royale mechanics. I like Soul Survivor. Not as good as the main mode, but I enjoy the variety and it's good that there is a game mode where you can only gain hunt dollars without investing any. In case you ever truly hit rock bottom. The next aspect of frustration I want to discuss is the game's nature as an extraction shooter. Your equipment is lost when you don't make it out of a match. So there is the initial hit of doing bad in a match and then you could also feel additional pain because you lost money, which might have consequences for future matches. So you start playing very conservatively and slow to preserve your equipment and avoid the frustration of losing it. It's commonly called gear fear and I think that you can get rid of it completely just by having knowledge about the economy. Here are 6 hunt showdown economy tips. After each match you can reshuffle the hunters in the recruitment tab, which always has a free hunter with free equipment. Remember to get it. 
all of the gear you pick up inside a match or you get from free hunters is contraband, which means that you cannot sell it. And you can't store more than two copies of the same contraband weapon and one copy of tools and consumables. Make sure to use your contraband equipment to save money. And you can use other hunters as contraband banks to go over the limit. One of the best money sources are dead hunters. Looting them will replenish your tools and consumables first. But when you're full on both, you get hunt dollars, which you have to extract with to keep. They can range from 50 to 1000 dollars. Use the perk pack mule to double the amount of consumables you loot, which means you get to loot hunt dollars more often, on top of just being one of the strongest perks in general. And the perk vulture if you're playing in trios. Normally, hunters can only be looted by two players. Vulture allows a third time. So make sure that the person with the perk is the last one to loot. Winning a match by bringing out a bounty will give you a bonus of 15% more XP and 20% more hunt dollars. But this bonus only applies to the first time this specific hunter escaped with a bounty today. You can see this golden icon next to them. The smart thing to do is to set this hunter aside for today and play them again tomorrow when they can get the bonus again. Especially useful when you combine this with the previous tip, because the 20% money bonus applies to all cash collected in the match. Dead hunters are included. Collecting clues always gives you 50 hunt dollars even if you die that match. It can be worth it to still collect a clue even if you already know the boss is in this compound. It's free money. Playing solo is an absolute money maker because you get a huge underdog bonus for winning. The skill-based matchmaking will put you against groups below your matchmaking rating, because you're outnumbered. I think this difference is big enough to make solo wins easier in some cases, while also paying you more. And my final tip is that you should try out many different weapons to find your favorites. A gun being more expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's going to perform better in your hands. You can find weapons that just click with you, while also being dirt cheap. Give me a crown and king and I might actually need all 5 shots to hit something. The high fire rate often leads me to spam and not aiming my shots careful enough. I'd rather just sell that thing and buy 4 Romeros for much better results. There should be something for everyone. The Springfield shines because it has the highest reload speed of all the single shot rifles. And with a little more money invested into dum dum ammo, it also becomes extremely oppressive in close combat. 38 dollars, plus 25 for dum dum. A windfield with levering is very strong in close combat and is still decently accurate up to 30 meters, where shotguns no longer one shot. 75 dollars. Crossbow is great for being stealthy, while also performing like a single shot shotgun with one taps into the head chest, lower torso and even arms at very close ranges. $50. A saber has the potential to wipe a team in a very short amount of time. $60. Knowing which weapons you like is also great when it comes to stealing expensive ones from other players. Winfield Slate with an uppercut? Don't mind if I do. That's a loadout I enjoy playing and it would have cost me $750. This is like an indirect way of making money. You can't sell the contrabands. But the idea is that the hand crossbow I started the match with is easily replaced with a price of $30. But that uppercut were 414, not so much. I'd rather have this in my arsenal. After learning these tricks, the gear fear just disappeared completely for me. And I hope these tips also make hunt less frustrating for you. Okay, now we are getting into the more negative side of my critique. I think basement compounds suck, because they encourage stalemates. When you're approaching the bounty team, the default situation is that they're inside covering the entrances. Which makes sense, because holding an angle is a strong strategy in any shooter. The real action and good gameplay of Hunt starts if you somehow stop the bounty team from holding the angle. And thankfully, Hunt has a lot of strategies for this. A cooked dynamite through a nasty angle could outright kill someone, but at the very least it forces them to move. The footsteps you hear give you a ton of info, number of players and their positions. Decoy fuses are especially effective for this, since you can use them three times for just one tool slot. I love them. Wall banks are a great way of killing someone without exposing yourself. You could see them through cracks in a wooden wall, use audio cues, 
dark side when you have a bounty and it goes both ways. The attacking and defending team can have interactions without actually seeing each other. The windows of a compound also allow the bounty team to engage the attacking team. If the bounty team gets a kill, it's usually a body that's easily covered. They could use the opportunity to push outside and gank the now outnumbered team. If the attacking team gets a kill, then they can use that to push inside. The remaining team members will most likely look for an option to revive, which means that they stop holding their angle. A lot of gunfights in Hunt Showdown need some form of spark to kick off the action. That's when everyone is running and gunning and bouncing actions and reactions off each other. A nice headshot. Decoy fuse to try and stop a revive. Risky instant revive by the enemies. Shooting a hive barrel. Peeking at the enemy because the triggered hive sound baits their aggression. Clearing the hive and running back to put pressure on the revive. Dynamite to force me away from my position. Risky peek to finish the last enemy and then dodging into cover. Now all of this is good, all of this is fun. But what happens if the bounty is in a basement compound? Well, not a lot happens. Dynamites and decoy fuses don't have nearly the same amount of pressure. When you start cooking a throwable, the enemy only knows about the starting position of the throw. They can't know which window, crack in a wall or doorway you are actually aiming for. That's what makes them so strong. A basement naturally creates choke points, because it's underground. And throwables are easily avoided if they can only come from one direction. Just run deeper into the basement when you hear them cook. And then go back to cover the entrance. Wall banks are also out, because the terrain of the map cannot be penetrated by anything. Stone walls can only be penetrated by a single weapon, the nitro. Can't see the enemy through cracks in a wall either, if you're underground. And of course, there are no windows. Most stalemate matches I had in Hunt were in basement compounds, because they limit the amount of viable opening strategies for the attacking team. So everyone is just holding angles. I think they need to be redesigned. Which compounds in particular have this issue? Pitching Crematorium, the Chapel of Madonna Noir and Stillwater Bend have a basement spawn 100% of the time. With Healing Waters Church it's a 50-50 if the boss spawns underneath the church. And Blanchet Graves has a basement as one of three possible spawns. But even the church itself is pretty bad. The main room is made of solid bricks, has no cracks, no real windows and only three entry points. And that is it for compounds with this issue. You may have noticed a pattern that all these compounds are on Stillwater Bayou, the first map. Lawson Delta and Desal just don't have basements. I think Crytek has only gotten better at designing maps for the particular gameplay of Hunt. If I were to rank the three maps, then it would also be their release order. Stillwater, Lawson and then Desal as the best one. It is a bit sad to say, because the original Bayou is such an important aspect of Hunt's identity. But gameplay is king, and the map design didn't age that well. So what is my suggestion? In the case of Healing Waters and Blorshed, we could just take out the basements as possible boss layer spawns. Still keep the map design as is, but the boss just won't ever be down there. But for Crematorium, the Chapel and Stillwater Bend it isn't as easy. There is no suitable building on any of these compounds. It's mostly just some ruins above ground. So a whole redesign would be necessary, which would take a lot of time, but I think it's worth it in the long run. I'm the type of player that prefers updates in games that touch up old content or fix long-standing issues, instead of bringing new content. The update that fixed the reload bug made me so happy, but reworked content isn't as marketable as new content. You can't really put improved synchronization of ammunition amounts for weapons, which should mitigate issues from receiving delayed server updates parenthesis, reload bug, into a trailer the same way a new boss or map can be showcased. A potential new player isn't gonna care. You always have to strike a balance between making new content to keep the game and player base fresh and reworking old content. And I think Crytek is doing a really good job. The Tide of Shadows event brought a new wild target boss, Rodjaw, and a new time of day with rain. Very cool, I like both. And in that same update, they allowed you to respect the health chunks and perks of your hunters for free. Also very cool. 
I hope that a compound redesign of Stillwater Bayou is something that's on their radar for a future update. I also want to take a moment to praise Crytek a bit and show how much their map design has evolved over the years by comparing two somewhat similar compounds, one old, one new. The Church of Blanchet Graves and the Pelican Island Prison. Both of them are made of solid brick, but the prison allows for a much wider variety of strategies. Like I mentioned, the main room of the church has three entry points, but one of them is an absolute death trap. It's a window that is high enough that you have to walk through it. You can't jump. Death traps could be placed underneath it, which aren't visible from outside without committing to a deadly vault. It's also extremely easily covered by a shotgun. And there is a piece of cloth that could cover an enemy inside. The church basically only has two viable entry points. And they are on the same side. Horrible compound in my opinion. Okay, here is the prison. Solid brick walls, but slanted windows on both long sides that allow for throwables into the boss layer. Four gates that lead into the main room with iron bars over them that allow the use of throwables and give you a view to the stairs. The stairs on both sides lead to higher positions where you can shoot back and forth. Inside the main room you can have some amazing close quarters fights, where you are both ducking and weaving around the stone walls and pillars. On the two long sides of the layer you have one way exits out which can allow the bounty team to leave and go for a flank. One of these exits is also accessible by doing a vault on one of the stairs and immediately swinging your camera to the left to slide into the window. A very cool tactic, but it is also telegraphed to the other players because the stairs leading up there are extremely loud and you will almost always give off a damage sound from the fall. Unless you hit the highest point within the window. In general, the prison is full of creaky metal floors that make it hard to get surprised. Most of the time you will know of each other's position and get a chance to play around with all the mechanics of this compound. I absolutely love the prison. Compound design is actually a pretty big component of Hunt's balancing. You can often see yourself getting frustrated by enemy playstyles in this game. Stop camping inside the boss layer with your shotgun. Stop camping outside with your rifle. I find that the blame can be misplaced onto the players, when the compound design is often the culprit for a stalemate. Why should the rifle players push into the basement entrance when you're sitting there with your shotgun? Why should the shotgun players run out the basement exit when you're aiming at it with your rifle? Hunt's gameplay just doesn't really work well with choke points. We need alternative routes to reposition, windows to jump out from and such. So I hope the devs do something about it. Next topic. I think the extractions on the map should never spawn clustered together. When they are only 50 meters apart, then it's basically like the match only has two extractions instead of three. In a situation like this, the best play with the highest chance of getting a bounty out is to remain passive and let someone else do the boss. They don't have an easy out of the match. They have to cross the entire map, which makes ambushing extremely easy. The bounty team is punished for doing the bounty which is not good design in my opinion. They are the ones pushing the objective. I think we need more rules for the spawning of extractions. Let's say that two extractions can't be on the same side of a map. And then they should also have a minimum distance between each other of let's say 200 meters to prevent corner spawns. I think this way there would still be enough randomness to add variety. But you always have at least one extraction point that is far away from the other two. This extraction can share sites with the others so it has to be further away. With these rules, there would still be cases where the extractions spawn extremely far away from the bounty. But if we prevent the clustering of extractions, then the bounty team at least has multiple directions to go, which increases the skill component for the ambushing teams. It's really simple to ambush if the bounty has to come a specific way, which in turn is likely going to lead to a stalemate, where the bounty team doesn't want to run into the obvious ambush. But if they have options, then the ambush requires more planning and map knowledge. Scoped weapons allow for an unhealthy playstyle. Some weapon classes dominate in their effective range. Shotguns in close range and long ammo rifles in long range. But I think scoped weapons have the biggest power gap if used in their effective range. You can adjust your loadout to have a fighting chance against close range shotguns. Fanning pistols, levering, quartermaster with a Romero hand cannon, dualies, 
a bow or any other hand cannon with slugs, a saber, a bayonet or talon variant of a rifle, fast firing pistols that don't need traits like the officer, new army, spitfire, dolch or bornheim, the mud carbine and drilling which are rifles with an extra shotgun barrel and even just a simple hand crossbow is kind of a sleeper hit. There is always the option to just hit a headshot with your rifle as well. But how do you adjust your weapons to account for players with scopes? I think you can't, besides bringing a scope yourself. I have three reasons for thinking this. 1. Only headshots matter in long range fights. 2. Scopes are perfect in hunt. And 3. The nature of third partying. Let's discuss the first, only headshots matter. In close range combat, you have a ton of options to confirm a kill after someone has been hit. Chasing for a follow up shot, wall banging, dynamites and so on. In a long range battle, both players have their cover they are peeking from. And if they take non lethal damage, then they can simply move behind cover and heal to full. Fully draining someone's healing resources in a ranged battle happens very rarely, ever since the regen shot got added to the game. Most scope players will probably bring one, as it's just too valuable if your opponent can't push you fast enough. Only headshots apply meaningful pressure. And there comes a point where the enemy is just too far away for you to reliably aim for the head. If the character model of your opponent has the width of your iron sights, then it's mostly guesswork if you're currently aiming at the pixel that's the head or the pixel that's the body. But if you see them through a scope, then you can always make the deliberate decision to go for a headshot. Which like I said is the only thing that applies pressure. As I mentioned in the gunplay section of this video, the weapons in this game have a lot of drawbacks because of the time period. But this design doesn't apply to scopes, they are perfect. They work even better than real life ones. The game has no bullet drop, only muzzle velocity. So scopes don't need multiple lines for something like 50, 100, 200 meters. It's just a matter of leading your target and not aiming above them. The position of the scope on the weapon also doesn't matter. Some weapons have it hanging off the side for example. But as far as the game mechanics are concerned, the crosshair within the scope becomes your barrel. That is where the bullet goes. It's kinda simple compared to all the effort that went into the other gun mechanics. And my last point is that the nature of third partying favors scope players and makes them close to immortal. The low time to kill that Hunt has means that attacking an enemy that is already occupied by something else is an incredibly strong strategy. But a close range ambush has multiple ways it could go wrong. And it will. They could get sound cues of your approach. You might fumble the bag and your aim is just terrible. They could be more aware than you thought and spot you. You might put yourself in the middle of both fighting teams. Because an enemy was rotating around in a way you didn't expect. But a long ranged ambush doesn't really have any of these drawbacks. Most actions in hunt have an immediate risk of killing your hunter if it goes wrong. While attempting a long range headshot is essentially a free action. If you have some long range scoper just taking shots at you and always repositioning, essentially just being an annoying wasp circling around you, then you can't really counter that. It's not like you can just leave your close range enemy team to take care of the sniper. The sniper will reposition or hide and the close range team will shoot you in the back. This strategy viewed from the other side would be to hide in a bush for the first few minutes of a match, wait for gunshots and make your way there. Just ignore the main objective and go for safe kills. Scopes allow for a very sweaty and KD focused playstyle, which isn't healthy for the game in my opinion. Long ammo is very dominant in this game, but I think this issue is specific to scoped weapons. Because someone using iron sights is generally still within a close enough distance to get punished for misplays. Before I go further in this discussion, I have to make one thing clear. Not every sniper plays like this. You can take your scope into medium range, but I think it's important to look at very extreme strategies if you want to have a well balanced game. For a very long time, Aftomat with dual sparks pistols was the most dominant close range loadout, until it received some much needed changes. It was a genuine easy mode, and a much bigger problem for the game than scopes have ever been. Still think the Aftomat is kinda busted but let's hope people don't pick up on that. I think scopes should be the next thing looked at, because the gameplay revolving around them is not that fun in my opinion. I said that you can't really adjust your weapons besides bringing scopes yourself. 
But there is actually something that allows you to deal with 90% of scope players you encounter. Stamina Shots, Magpie and Greyhound. They don't want you to know this, but if a scope player hasn't pushed the bounty within 2 seconds of you picking it up, then you are just legally allowed to leave. I always do it and it rarely fails. The thing about running away with stamina is that the enemy can only be as fast as you or slower. If the sniper also has stamina, then you are the same speed. If they don't, then they are slower. If you kill AI in a smart way and have good pathing around the map, then you are just two points on a map far away from each other moving at the same speed. You are never gonna meet. That's the gameplay I have against snipers. Scopes are tough to balance and hunt. They are in a very weird spot. Only scopers can have meaningful mechanical interactions with each other, while every other loadout gets the best results by not engaging them at all and just looking for other opponents in another match. It's a strange dynamic. And right now I am seeing a lot of hate for scope players within the community. For the purpose of this section I had to play scopes to gather footage. And the drop chance of hate mail was increased by about 500%. People in public matchmaking will often dodge your lobby if they see a scope on your weapon. There's a saying within the community that goes scopers equals snopers. Can't really blame them. They probably had a bad experience of people sitting way outside of the fight where they are not in a position to revive teammates or finishing a fight with only one remaining enemy who is now reviving everyone, effectively undoing all the work the other teammates put in. So what would be the best thing to do? I think the low risk nature of scopes can't be addressed easily. One way to do it would be to have sniper scope glints like other shooters do, but that would just outright kill these weapons in hunt. Not a good fix. Wouldn't fit hunt either when the game is based on good positioning and sounds, but then has a mechanic that just shows everyone your location. Something drastic like adding bullet drop also wouldn't work because of the kind of guns we use in hunt. Most shooters with bullet drop have the advantage of a modern time period. So instead of using iron sights, you're mostly aiming with holo sights and red dots. Bullet drop works because these sights still have room inside their window below the aim point. So you can keep your target on screen. And what's below the aim point of a gun in Hunt Showdown? Wood. You can't see the enemy. So adding bullet drop for longer ranges might have the inverse effect and further widen the gap between rifles and scope rifles. I think weapon sway might be the mechanic to look at. When you're very close, then sway barely moves you off target. But when you're far, then you have to fight the sway to keep aiming. Sway gives an incentive to be closer to the enemy and makes long range shots more skillful. That's a way to balance scopes. The issue is the perk steady aim. After aiming through the scope for 8 seconds, the perk kicks in and you basically don't have any significant sway anymore. Every scope player wants to run this. It's really strong. But this perk promotes the sit far away, hard scope and never move playstyle. You don't want to unscope because you'd have to invest 8 seconds again. I think it might be best to remove this perk. I don't think it's healthy. Without it, sway would be more of a balancing factor for scopes. Maybe this change alone would be enough. If not, then the sway of all scoped weapons could be increased. Perhaps a bigger increase for sniper and marksman scopes. Because their high zoom is often used for the unhealthy playstyle. I don't really have an issue with dead eye and aperture scopes. What do you think? Now we go from long range combat to close range combat. Because I think the terminal shotgun with levering is very stupid. It's high fire rate, high capacity and high spread. This combo leads to a really brainless playstyle. You can just empty this thing without aiming your shots carefully and getting really good results. It's a death machine in close combat. And what I find really unusual is that it performs well at medium ranges, where no shotgun should have any business of being fired. This has to do with the aim punch mechanic. Remember earlier in the video I said that the aim punch doesn't change based on the damage you receive. Terminus levering profits so much from this fact. When you see someone at like 20 meters you can just start levering and they will get absolutely knocked around. I think you really have to see this from the other perspective to understand how disruptive a terminus going full auto on you is. Keep in mind that this test is also in favor of the person getting levered at. Since I know what's about to happen to me and already have my aim on the enemy. In a real match there's going to be a bigger delay before the player realizes what's happening. And good luck trying to spot the person in between aim punches before it's too late. The high spread of the terminus makes it so that basically every shot deals at least some damage, even if it's aimed poorly. 
I think this is also why the Crown and King shotgun is different. It has the same cycle time, but much tighter spread. The lower spread makes the Crown the stronger gun. But you also can't really do the brainless terminus playstyle I'm talking about. Tighter spread means you have to aim better to cause an aim punch. And two less shots in the magazine actually make a huge difference in the case of the ranged aim punch battle. It's usually the last one or two shots that ends up getting the kill with the terminus. One drawback of the terminus I have to mention here is the movement penalty of levering. Levering slows you down similar to being jump or crouch locked. Without levering you can go from shooting to sprinting immediately. But with it you have to wait out a specific time. Each levering weapon has a different movement penalty duration. And while the duration is not equal to the cycle time of the weapon, they still correlate. The basic idea is that slower firing levering will have a longer movement penalty. It isn't as big of a deal on the normal Winnie, but in some cases it can end up killing you. The terminus however makes you extremely slow, an obvious drawback to using terminus levering. But ironically this just further pushes you into the brainless playstyle. The correct way to play the terminus is to never stop levering, just become a turret. Trying to move and re-aiming your shots is how you lose. You have to fully commit. The idea is that so long as you can't aim at me, I'm just gonna keep levering. But thankfully the weapon stats of Hunt are kept low, so that even a small numbers change could fix this issue. What I would like is to decrease the terminus levering fire rate by 10%. I feel like this should be just enough time to aim between aim punches. But then the movement penalty should also be lowered in my opinion. I imagine the weapon would feel horrible with the current movement penalty along with the decreased fire rate I proposed. Would be better if you had higher mobility to compensate for the DPS loss. I also think the base fire rate without levering should be increased. Right now the terminus is extremely dependent on the perk. In my opinion it is the worst full size shotgun. But with levering I would honestly say it's the second best only surpassed by Crown and King Slugs. So stronger base version of the gun and reduced effects of the perk. Hunt is usually pretty good at balancing weapon options against each other. The same doesn't really apply to the melee tools. The knuckle knife is just the best one. There are basically four things you want from your melee tool. It needs to be stamina efficient, so that you can clear compounds fast without stopping to regen stamina. It needs to kill lots of AI in a short time, in the case of a panic situation when an enemy team spots you. It needs to be good against players, as a last resort when everything else failed. And it needs two different damage types to cover you against the weaknesses of bosses and mob enemies. Knuckle Knife is second place for stamina efficiency behind Dusters. And it has the fastest attack speed with heavy attack stabs which makes it the best tool for killing lots of AI and last resort PvP situations as well. Plus it has the best combination of damage types with blunt and piercing. If you're using the two knives and encounter an immolator, then you have to resort to melee attacking with your guns, which drains all stamina and takes long. You would imagine that the dust dust tool would be the winner for immolators, cause it's fully committed to being the blunt damage tool but it drains more stamina than the knuckle knife and kills them at basically the same speed. The whole balance is kinda out of whack. The knuckle knife only has two small downsides. It has less damage than the two knives. But this damage difference effectively only matters for one single type of AI. Hellhounds are the only enemies where it matters. The three other tools can kill them with one attack, knuckle knife can't. Next best thing is two light attacks. This makes it worse against groups of hellhounds. But it isn't so bad because the first light attack always throws the hound back. The second follow up hit is basically guaranteed against the immobilized hound. The other downside is that you can't clear concertina wire. Because that requires a slashing attack and you only have blunt and stab. Isn't so bad because throwing axes are an amazing tool in general and they cover this weakness as well. Dynamite sticks and your own body also work to clear concertina. I think the knuckle knife just has too much going for it. And I would like it if the other tools got buffed to better carve out their own niches. The dusters and the heavy knife could get damage increases to their heavy attacks. They are fully committed to a single damage type. So they work well against some enemies but suffer against others. A damage increase could make them really excel at killing their specific enemies. 
I find it kinda dumb that dust does need that third heavy attack against an emulator. While the knuckle knife can do 4 light attacks for less stamina. The breakpoint for the damage increase should be emulators only taking 2 heavy attacks, in my opinion. The heavy knife damage could get bumped up to 125 to kill a hunter missing one health chunk into the upper torso. Most PvP situations are decided by a hit to the head. And the heavy knife has less range than the normal knife and the knuckle knife. Plus it has a sweeping motion instead of a forward lunge, which is a lot weaker in my opinion. The heavy knife especially struggles when elevation is involved in a knife battle. A stabbing motion is much easier to course correct towards the enemy's head. Because you can drag the attack with your camera while the hitbox is active. Dragging works with all melee attacks. But with a sweeping motion it's really awkward to course correct an attack that would otherwise have missed. With a stab motion it's like you're drawing with a fine needle. All of this is to say that the heavy knife is the worst option for PvP in my opinion. The ability to one hit kill a hunter at 125 health would give it the edge over the other tools in some situations. And it would improve the overall performance against enemies weak to rending damage, like the butcher boss. The regular knife could probably use better stamina efficiency. Here is the stamina consumption for every type of AI compared to the knuckle knife. The second value is always the knuckle knife. Grunts and hives take 25 versus 18. Hive swarms take 60 versus 14. Hellhounds are 25 versus 14. Armors are 75 versus 50. And for emulators, it's the full stamina bar of 100 because you use the gun. Versus knuckle knives, 28 stamina. The difference is just way too high. The light attack should probably be 10 stamina instead of 20. And the heavy 20 instead of 25. This way there would be trade-offs for the melee tools. With the current balancing, the other tools aren't even an option for me personally. Now I want to talk about a specific perk. Because it's not really in a good place right now. Necromancer. And more specifically, solo necromancer. This perk allows you to revive a teammate from a distance of up to 25 meters at the cost of health, taking some time and being stuck inside Darkseid which limits the visuals and audio. As a solo player you can revive yourself with this perk after 10 seconds have passed. It is oftentimes a very risky revive. The perk has been in the game for a long time and now most players know that you should keep an eye on a downed body and the revive animation is very long so it's highly likely that you just get downed again. But in some cases, the solo version of this perk can break the balance quite a bit. The revive happens at the press of a button. And you can always do it, so long as you still have health chunks left. With a team of necromancers, the reviving stops once the entire team is wiped. And they're thrown back to the menu. But a solo necromancer could be lying there for 20 minutes. And just be grabbing food from the kitchen or something. This isn't much of an issue when you know they are a solo. You can burn them, which does give them a timer to revive or leave the match. I think the perk becomes an issue in huge gunfights, where the entire lobby meets on one compound. In such fights, you can't always keep track which player belongs to which team. You might down a solo player and think it was the teammate of someone. But now the solo is just lying there unaccounted for and waiting for their moment. Even if you do know it's a solo, you might not be able to dedicate time to watching the body and burning it. Because the other teams are still trying to kill you. All it needs is a few seconds for the solo to get up and dodge into cover. Another aspect to consider in these big group fights is the depletion of resources. Everyone is losing something in the fight. Consumables, healing supplies, ammo and the health chunks of your team to keep reviving each other. But the solo that's lying there on the ground is not depleting resources. They could wait out the entire fight and get up when there's only one surviving team left. And that surviving team is most likely in a very broken state while the solo is doing pretty good. Combine this with the surprise of a solo getting up when the last remaining team thought they wiped the server and the solo has very high odds to just snack an easy win from a team that fought hard. The solo is basically getting to the endgame of the fight without having the resource investment of the groups. That's not really balanced. I think the best way to balance this is to have a maximum timer between revives. One minute is what I'd propose. So you'd have a 10 second timer before you could use the perk. And then you have 60 seconds to use the perk. Otherwise it deactivates. 
This would mean that the solo has to participate in the fight and risk losing resources. And they also risk exposing themselves as a solo player, which gives the other teams multiple opportunities to recognize that player as a solo necromancer and put a permanent stop to it with fire and traps. Solo necromancer is a necessary part of Hunt's balance, in my opinion. Sometimes you just have an unfortunate death to PvE, a trap, or you are overconfident against the boss. As a team, you can just kinda laugh that off, as they revive you. You lost the health chunk and that's a bummer, but the match continues. If something like that happens as a solo, then that would be it. You lost this match. In this case, solo necromancer gives you the same leeway that groups are allowed. You lose a health chunk, but get to keep playing. Same goes when you trade kills with an enemy. Your teammates have the potential to get you back up. But now imagine a solo fights a duo and trades with the last team member. There would just be three bodies lying there and nobody gets anything. That's why I think solo necromancer is important to keep. But we should limit its power a bit. With my proposed change, solo necromancer would still work against unfortunate deaths and trading. But you couldn't endlessly stall a match until it's the right time for you to revive. In general, I think Hunt's skill based matchmaking works really well. You are ranked between 1 and 6 stars. Kills make you go up, deaths bring you down. And the stars of your opponent matter. A 5 star killing a 3 star will give a very small boost to the matchmaking rating. And the 3 star also won't lose that much. But if it's the other way around, then the 3 star will climb a lot for killing an enemy with higher stars. And the 5 star will drop a lot. It's a good system. And I find that I'm usually in lobbies with people that are about even with me. But there are two ways in which this system fails. Besides the main mode Bounty Hunt, there is also Soul Survivor. And the way your MMR is affected by this game mode leads to some problems. Soul Survivor does not match you up against players based on your rating. It's just a matter of who pressed the Q button at the same time. You can find anyone from 1 to 6 stars in here. But here is the weird thing. The outcome of the match still changes your rating. You can queue up as a 5 star, get killed by a 4 star and then end up as a 4 star. This makes your rating extremely volatile. In Bounty Hunt you are matched against players close to your star rating. And so the deaths and kills won't have a dramatic impact. You usually stay inside a bracket for a decent amount of games. However, a few soul survivor matches could throw you inside a bracket you really don't belong into. A couple of deaths against players with less stars and you'll start playing against them in your regular games, which isn't fair to them. In the same way, a few soul survivor kills against high star players could catapult you into their lobbies and you'll get dumpstered on for the next games. This aspect of soul survivor can also be used to intentionally derank. Sometimes you'll see a player just firing their guns to get your attention and then giving up to be killed. Their MMR will tank and so they'll get easier bounty hunt games without investing anything and without affecting their main KD, since the two modes have separate KD tracking. That's very scummy of them. And I think the game shouldn't allow for such a strategy to exist. If this game mode has no skill based matchmaking, then it also shouldn't affect your rating. It's really simple. And it would have a big effect on the overall quality of Hunt's matchmaking. Less people would be stuck inside brackets they don't belong into, either intentionally or unintentionally. There's another way the MMR system fails in my opinion. And that is because of the perk Necromancer. The matchmaking system counts every single one of your downs the same way. So Necromancer can lead to some rapid MMR drops. I think this is the most significant with the solo version of this perk. As a solo you are matched up against duos or trios and other solos. The groups you face will have a much lower star rating than you. At this point you can probably guess what the issue is. Solo Necromancer leads to rapid deaths against players with less stars than you. So your MMR gets annihilated. Once again, this can be used intentionally to drop your MMR to get easier games. Or unintentionally because you think that there's a decent chance you won't be downed again. Which does happen. The perk is strong if used correctly. What I would like is a MMR grace period of 5 seconds after Necromancer is used. Either from a teammate or as a solo. The MMR will be completely unaffected. And it should be for both players. Downing a player inside their revive animation is much much easier than getting a regular kill. And rewarding the same MMR boost leads to inflated MMRs. 
Once again, people stuck inside brackets they don't belong into. 5 seconds should be enough for the player to recover, which means it's an even playing field and the MMRs should be affected once again. A 5 second grace period would lead to a more accurate matchmaking rating for all players involved. Crytek has been using events to test new perk ideas and then adding some perks to the game permanently. For example, solos reviving themselves with Necromancer wasn't always a game mechanic. First, this was only possible during a timed event. And then it got added as a permanent function. I think the event perk Remedy is a good one to add. It's very healthy in my opinion. The perk allows you to trigger a restoration effect for your team by using Darkseid on a trade spur in the world. The entire team will get a full heal and have all their lost health chunks restored. Right now, a spawn fight with another team can cost you a bunch of health chunks. And you might not want to contest a bounty afterwards because your hunter is too broken. You'd have better results by just extracting from the match, buying the health chunks back and going into a fresh match. This would mean that the bounty team likely won't have any PvP action, because one team is dead and another team is leaving. Remedy allows you to heal your team and keep the action going for this match. The only way this perk could be considered too strong is if you could easily use it during gunfights. But I think there is too much randomness tied to the perk. A team member needs to have upgrade points to buy the perk between matches. Your team needs to be missing health chunks in the gunfight. A trade spur needs to spawn within range of the gunfight. The player that bought Remedy needs to be in a position to actually use it. They could be the first one to get downed and then not get revived until the fight is over. And the opposing team would need to give you a long enough opening to aim at the trade for 10 seconds. The plan could fail at any of these steps. Most notably, the trade actually spawning in a close enough distance to get value out of Remedy. That's very rare. Even if you do manage to use it in a fight, hunters have a lightning effect around them when they receive a restoration effect. So the other team would know that Remedy was used. I think the most common use of Remedy would be to refresh your team after a fight by searching trades in the surrounding compounds, which is pretty balanced and just increases the amount of PvP fights you can have in one match. There was an update that changed the in-game economy of the premium currency blood bonds. The idea of the update was to significantly reduce the amount of blood bonds you can earn in-game, but then also cut away all the aspects of blood bonds that affected the gameplay. So now this currency is only used for cosmetics, but you have to pay real money for it or do all the weekly missions for a long long time. I don't care too much about this change. Yes, I do miss the ability to buy skins just from playing the game a lot. But the gameplay of Hunt is what I really care about. And there is one change that didn't happen when I think it needed to. Hunter slots are still bought with blood bonds. And they do give you a gameplay advantage that isn't insignificant. First off, they can serve as banks for contraband items. Pretty useful to save Hunt dollars. But buying Hunter slots for this reason isn't that impactful in my opinion. You start the game with 5 Hunter slots. And I've never used more than 2 Hunters as banks. Most often one is enough. The real gameplay benefit comes from the two upgrade points you can sometimes get from the daily tribute. Get it once and you can buy a perk like Bulwark, Dauntless, Kite Skin and Magpie. Get it twice and you're looking at Levering, Necromancer, Pack Mule, Serpent, Silent Killer, Bloodless, Bolt Thrower, Ghoul, Iron Eye, Resilience and Vigor. Perks that all have the potential to turn a losing match into a win. And I think the benefit from buying extra hunter slots with real money goes beyond just mere cosmetics or convenience. Every hunter in your roster gets these two upgrade points. So if you bought no hunter slots, then you can have 5 hunters with these perks. If you did buy slots, then you could have 75 hunters with these perks. That affects gameplay. And it only keeps scaling up from here. You're never gonna run out of hunters if you have all 75 slots. So the top half of your roster just keeps piling on these upgrade points. Until they can buy every single perk in the game. Effectively becoming a level 50 hunter without ever actually playing a match with that hunter. And all of that just cause you paid with your credit card. I don't like it. I don't think it's bad enough to call the game pay to win or anything. But it's still a bit unfair in my opinion. I would like it if there was another in-game way to earn more slots. My suggestion would be to give one slot for every prestige level, on top of the usual rewards. 
it's something to work for and gives the prestige system an extra incentive. Alternatively, their price could be reduced to 50 blood bonds each, instead of 150. Not my preferred option, but still better. We are slowly getting to the end of the video. So now I have some rapid fire criticisms and suggestions, which were too small for their own sections. I wish we had the ability to set a preference for the health chunks of our hunters. Most likely a player has a specific arrangement of health chunks they like the most. And this isn't something you decide for every individual match. You want them always the same exact way. It used to be that the health chunks could only be changed with blood bonds. But now that it's completely free, we should just get the option to set a preference for them. And the chunks of every recruited hunter will follow that preset. At this point it would just save time inside menus. No effect on balance or gameplay. I'd like the ability to favorite perks. The same way you can favorite weapons in the arsenal. Would speed up the process. If you didn't have to always scroll through the list of all perks or type their names into a search bar. I'd love the option to drag and drop equipment. I have set specific keybinds for all four consumables. Because I like the certainty of equipping the correct thing instantly, instead of scrolling through. For example Q will always give me my vitality shot, which I need fast in the heat of a battle. Equipping consumables for all four slots is very clumsy however, because you have to unequip them and then re-equip them to the specific slot. It's especially annoying if you're dealing with contraband items. Because then the act of unequipping can bring you over the contraband item limit. And so the item would be discarded. So now you'd have to grab another hunter, equip them with the contraband item, unequip the item from the first hunter and re-equip it. All just to move something from slot 2 to slot 3. You can swap item slots inside a mission by holding down the keybinds. But I don't trust myself to always remember that at the start of each match. I'd rather have the certainty and go through the clumsy re-equip process between matches. A drag and drop option would be much appreciated. I also have a suggestion for sound design. Hunters can actually give off two different damage sounds. One is a small grunt of pain. The other is a lot more visceral, like they are getting the wind knocked out of them. The threshold for the second sound is 50 damage. And the fact that it's only 50 damage makes the distinction between the two sounds pretty meaningless for the gameplay. To me this seems like a relic of an older version of Hunt. Hunters used to start at 100 HP. And so the 50 damage threshold made sense. Communicates that they are at least half dead. But nowadays Hunters always have 150 HP. And knowing that you hit someone for at least one third of their health is just very weak information. There is just too much room between the damage values 50 and 149. A more useful threshold for the bigger damage sound would be 100 HP in my opinion. Most rifles and pistols have now settled on a damage stat above 100 into the upper torso. And so the difference for the two damage sounds could give you a confirmation which body part you hit. If it's the arm then it's below 100 damage, so they play the smaller sound. Would give the player a better idea of how much pressure they're really putting on the enemy. Cause right now there might as well only be one damage sound. Bullet grubber is too expensive. The perk is nice. But when you're buying a perk for your hunter, you always have to weigh your options against other perks in that same price bracket. If your hunter has 4 upgrade points, then you're looking at all the 4 point perks. And bullet grubber just loses against pretty much all the options. Beast face, levering, necromancer, pack mule, serpent, silent killer. Only determination is below it in my opinion. What you're paying 4 upgrade points for is basically just quality of life since you can hold shots to prevent the ammo loss. It's a perk I never buy and always respec for the points it gives. I think it should cost 2 or maybe even just 1 upgrade point. The crosshair of shotguns is lying to you. I think the game would be better if it stopped lying. For rifles and pistols the crosshair works as you'd expect. It shows the possible area in which the bullet could be fired from the hip. For shotguns I have no idea what the crosshair means. It is not the pellet spread. For every single shotgun in the game, the spread of pellets is much tighter than the crosshair. But the crosshair still changes for the different shotguns. So it has to measure something, I just don't know what. In any case, I think the game would be improved if the crosshair accurately showed the pellet spread. Would make it easier to compare shotguns and get a feel for the individual spread of them. Cause right now, the spread is just something vague you figure out by using shotguns over hundreds of hours. It is also a pretty mean trap for new players that adds confusion. 
someone might fire a shotgun and be completely baffled that they didn't even receive a hit marker, when most of the crosshair was on the target. How could they know that the game is lying? And that the real crosshair was indeed completely off. It's not intuitive. A match replay option would be amazing for Hunt. Because of the game's high focus on tactical elements and sound design, you can often find yourself dying without really understanding how it got to that point. People repositioning in smart ways or using the cover of loud sounds to move around quietly. When you're new to the game, the things experienced players can do to you can sometimes feel like magic. And the simple kill view option doesn't really tell you the whole story. You need the 20 or so seconds before the kill to observe the decision making. I think the ability to rewatch a match from all POVs would bring three benefits. Hunt would be easier to get into for new players because they have better tools to learn from their opponents. It would make Hunt a less frustrating game because mistakes could be better understood. And lastly, it would just be cool to see a nice fight from the enemy side with all their reactions to the things you did. I don't really know if Crytek servers could support such a feature. Maybe it could be restricted to only safe replays for 24 hours. That would give players the option to record the replay if they want to keep it permanently. If that is also too much, then a simple 2D replay of the map would already be a huge improvement. Showing the positions of all 12 players and simple actions like who killed who, boss banish started, players reviving each other and such. The swap speed of older pistols is faster, which seems like a bug. Every pistol from the 1.0 version of Hunt Showdown has the fast swap speed. All the new ones are slower. This could be a conscious design decision to differentiate the guns further and to weigh the options against each other. But the fact that you can draw an exact line in the version history of the game when the swap speeds got slower makes it seem like a bug to me. In my opinion, it also wouldn't be a good balancing decision if it was intentional. Faster swap speed invalidates most other stats of a gun. Picture two players drawing their pistols at the same time and one of them can just fire before the other player. What does it matter if the other gun has faster cycle time, more damage and range? Being the first to fire is the best advantage you could have. I used to like the new army pistol a lot before I knew about this issue. But now I will always take the older Nagant officer. It's simply better. Swap speed should be the same for all pistols. There is one skin for the Winfield Talon which has a clearer iron sight. The regular Talon and the second skin have a block on the left that obscures your vision a bit. The fact that this one skin doesn't have it is like a tiny bit of pay to win. It almost doesn't matter. But as far as I understand it, this block doesn't even have a reason to be on this weapon in the first place. It's a scope mount on a weapon variant without a scope. Just remove it for all versions of the Winfield Talon. Hunter skins can also give a benefit. And in this case, I think it does have a huge impact on the gameplay. Some skins basically work as camouflage. The three most prominent ones are Kane, the Headsman and the Reptilian, in my opinion. All of them have a very monotone color palette, with nothing that particularly sticks out. The Headsman is the worst offender. He is basically just a grey and black spot on your screen, that blends in with most environments the game has to offer. It's very easy for a skin like this to appear on your screen without you noticing it. Skins should only be something fun and cosmetic. If they give a huge gameplay benefit, then the devs have failed in my opinion, because skins are bought with real world money. You can't fully remove the gameplay impact of skins. A legendary hunter with mostly dark clothes will always be better than a basic white shirt. But I think the extreme outliers of skins should be addressed. Most skins are balanced by having one very distinct part that breaks the color palette. It's usually on the head and it's usually a mask. The problematic skins should be changed to include these types of design decisions. So those were all the things I wanted to talk about in Hunt Showdown. I love this game. When it comes down to the gunfights, there is just no shooter I'd rather play. I think it's masterfully designed. And I'm also very happy about the direction the game is heading. A new map is supposed to come in early 2024 and it's going to be in a new biome. Like I said, I think the map design of Crytek keeps getting better, so I'm very excited for it. There will also be improvements for the network side of things, to address rubber banding and trade windows. Also really excited about that. And I've been having a lot of fun with the events we are getting. As a little side note for this video, I hope I was using the terms correctly when it came to gun mechanics, the way they operate and such. I'm from Europe, I've never even seen a gun. 
If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to see future content. Until then, goodbye.